Hello and welcome to the season and series finale of CBC Arts Exhibitionists. I'm your host, Amanda Paris. For the past few years, I've spent my days hosting TV and radio shows, but my nights are spent writing for the stage. The theater has been on my mind a lot over the past few months as artists scramble to make sense of an uncertain future. William Shakespeare once famously wrote, all the world's a stage. But in today's episode, we consider the question, if all the world's formal stages are closed as a result of a global pandemic, where does the theater go? And perhaps even more importantly, how do we want it to change when it comes back? First, I sit down with theater director Ravi Jain to talk about his ideas for the future of Canadian theater. Then we head to the West Coast where a group of performers are bringing the stage to your doorstep courtesy of a flatbed truck. A panel of experts discuss how playwrights and companies are adapting in the midst of the pandemic. And then we revisit some key lessons from acclaimed theater director, Philip Aiken. <laughs> Ravi Jain is a multi-award-winning stage director whose work has made headlines for being politically bold and creatively accessible in ways that have shaken up the Canadian theatre industry. As the founding artistic director of Why Not Theatre, Ravi has continued to push the envelope. As other companies attempt to bring the theatre to virtual and audio platforms, Ravi has taken the pandemic as an invitation to reimagine the entire industry. I sit down with Ravi at his Why Not Theatre office to find out where he wants theatre to go and how he wants it to change when the stages are reopened. So thank you so much, Ravi, for uh, doing this interview and welcoming us into your beautiful space. This thanks. is so wonderful. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you about the state of theatre right now. We're going to take a moment to talk about you as a theatre creator, but first I want to talk to you about as, as a theatre lover. Traditional theatres have been shuttered because of COVID-19 and social distancing. We're not allowed to gather in groups and, and watch works of art together. How have you been feeling just as a theatre lover in this time? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's been sad, right? Like, uh, that's why we do what we do, is we love to bring people together and, um, you know, uh, share in stories and build community and share that energy. And a lot of us had so many projects that we had to either cancel or postpone. So there's a process of kind of grieving that and like letting it go. And um, as we all take this time to just like reflect on the conditions of our industry and how we've been rolling, so COVID, and obviously Black Lives Matter helps us to really think about the precarity of freelance workers and the way we've been working and then the barriers of access for BIPOC folks. And so how do we think about, for us as a company, we've really been thinking about not so much, you know, uh, what we do and when we get back, but rather how we make the theater and how can we sort of think about better ways to create a better process that is more healthy for more people. Well, yeah, let's talk a little bit about yeah. that because you have chosen not to necessarily switch your programming to adapt it to COVID-19 as a lot of theater companies have done, but instead to focus your time on supporting and developing new artists or artists that are already in the industry but might need a little extra support. Why do you find that approach so necessary and urgent right now? Well, I think because kind of where you started, right? Like, so COVID stopped our relationship with the with audiences for this moment. So we just have to accept that. It's just, we're not gonna be able to um, have a relationship with, with uh, let's say, with, with audiences, but we still have a relationship with artists. So we can continue that work and we can continue um, developing work and developing talent. And our approach is to say, well, if we know that the process isn't working, so how do we, um, strengthen the people, the artists, and give them the tools, the access, the resources, you know, the heavy weights to start lifting now so that when we come back, we're just stronger, more healthy, and they can, they can be the voices that are leading the conversations rather than the voices that tend to be uh, in the backgrounds or having to assist and observe. Now we can actually build the bench to say, no, when we come back, we're gonna run and we're gonna run fast and we're gonna be behind you rather than you being behind us. Let's talk about one of the ways that you are working towards that. Um, one of the ways is creating access for artists through the Space Project. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about why space is such a huge issue for artists in this city and also just in general? 
So, I mean, when you live in Toronto, you, space hurts your pocket hard. So yeah. living space, we know, is already super costly. So obviously that means that rehearsal space, performance space, uh, it's a huge cost for theater artists. And um, it's also, the access to that space is even harder. And we said to ourselves, you know, if we had to buy a building, we'd have to raise like $6 million, which we've never done, mm -hmm. uh, which is a crazy amount of money. And uh, we'd be limited by capacity. And I said, if I could raise $6 million, I could change the game for everyone tomorrow night, as opposed to investing in this one building. So we started going, well, what if we treated Toronto like our theater? So the idea was, let's take all the underutilized space, figure out a way to get into it, and create temporary rehearsal hall spaces. And the vision for us, too, was that that's totally free. What if space could be free for artists? How would that change who gets to make the art? And how would that change what audiences would come to see that art eventually when mm. it gets on stages? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a big problem too in the arts. The cheap spaces are often in dank, dark basements. Right, I was gonna ask, what are the types of spaces that you've been accessing? Yeah, so like anything from a community space, uh, like a Portuguese community center mm. in, in Little Portugal, uh, to this relationship that we have with Crest Point, which is an investment property company, um, that gave, they gave us a beautiful room at 215 Spadina. Mm. And Crest Point also gave us access to a 15,000 square foot warehouse, wow. um, which is so rare for mm -hmm. an artist to get to access. And yeah, they're they're clean, they're nice, and, and it's just, you know, the space that's ready to be there. We're in this moment that we don't know, and we don't know when it's gonna end, this COVID-19 moment. How do you maintain optimism and positivity in the midst of all this? Because you have all these visions and all these dreams for when it will end, and that requires a degree of optimism. So how do you how do you maintain that? Yeah. Um, and stay inspired. That's a great question. I mean, I have my bad days. <laughs> <laughs> do you? I, do, I don't I do. believe you. I definitely do. Um, I, I'm very fortunate because I'm doing a project with David Suzuki and his mm. partner, Tara Cullis. We're making a theater show. And so um, I asked him a very similar question. And I said, you know, like, how do you, how do you stay positive, especially in the face of climate change? And for 50 years, they've been fighting to, 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 you know, add it to help us save ourselves to save the planet. And he said, you know, um, we have our bad days, but like, uh, if I give up, you know, what, nothing happens. So, give up for that hour, dust yourself off, and then get back in there. Like, we have no choice. We have no choice but to keep at it and to keep fighting. Um, so what else, what other choice do we have? What else are we gonna do? We gotta do it. <laughs> but the truth is, because people fought for us. We're here because people fought hard for us to be able to be practicing and to have the privileges that you and I have to be sitting in this moment, and we, we, we have to make good on that. Thank you so much, Ravi, for Thank talking you. with us and sharing your space and for helping to give me a little bit of inspiration and optimism as well, too. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. It's so good Hi. to see you. You too. Yeah. <laughs> coming up, who needs a playhouse when you have a flatbed truck? We head to Victoria to meet with four performers delivering theater on the road. I don't think I've ever thought that it would be like the end of theater or that theater would not bounce back. I think the bizarre thing about theater is that it's been dying for decades. <laughs> and the people who love theater and who love doing it and watching it, we just won't let it die. We have a truck that we perform on. And in the past years, people would go into the back of the truck and sit and watch shows. We've taken apart that little theater and we've made that into one stage and we perform for people from a distance now. Thank you for supporting your local theater and I hope you enjoy our first show. My name is Hannah. I'm Sarah. My name is Linnea. And I'm Kendra. Most of us are early career artists. Okay, Chevy's off the tailpipe. <laughs> Are those new muslops? Boy, oh, oh, I bet its fuel efficiency is meh. We all started off brainstorming and writing just like whatever came to mind. A lot of it is improv based and audience like participation based. You there, think of a color. I feel like in any of my other performances, no one's ever really taken the time to come up to me and say how much they appreciate what we've done where it's like yeah. that happened a lot this summer where people were just like really thankful that we came and we're doing what we were doing. The color is pink. 
But now you're thinking of pink. Thank you, I've done it again. I've done it again. So we ended up with four sets that are about 15 minutes long that have like three to four different elements to them. The person booking the show to their door could pick which show they wanted. And there was like a little description on our website. People have been telling us when we perform, they are just big theater fans and it's been so hard for them to not be able to watch any theater. People are creative and people are kind and people like to watch things that are stupid. If you give people the opportunity to see theater in whatever weird form it comes in, there are people who will still want to watch it. Doing this this summer, it almost felt like selfish. Every theater in the country, in the world, is shut down. We get to do this weird little thing where we drive this truck around, and it's amazing that it's bringing joy to other people, but like, wow, is it bringing joy to me that I get to do this? The theater world is grappling with some major changes, but none of those changes mean that theater in Canada is on hold. Playwrights and companies are quickly adapting to a rapidly changing world. Joining us now is Nina Lee Aquino, the Artistic Director of Toronto's Factory Theatre, Nick Green, a Dora and Sterling award-winning playwright who founded the Social Distancing Festival, Sherry Yoon, the Artistic Director for Vancouver's experimental theatre company Boca del Lupa, and our moderator today is Glenn Sumi of Now Magazine in Toronto. He spent more than two decades covering and critiquing theatre. Take it away, Glenn. Thanks, Amanda, and thank you to Sherry, Nick, and Nina for joining me. Let's start with you, Nina. You're the Artistic Director of Factory Theatre in Toronto, and you've got quite an unusual season ahead called the Satellite Season. What are some of the things you're doing to get around not having your audience all in one place? Well, we are uh, going to fully explore um, the hybrid of theatre and virtual the virtual realm. So, you know, we uh, have commissioned playwrights and we'll be using our spaces, but instead of a live audience, the cameras are going to be in place. And that's where that will be kind of the new medium that the stage will have to share with now uh, with the actors as well. So it's going to be different, but we're ready to play. Uh, Nick, you're working on a musical right now called Living the Dream that takes place entirely on the Zoom platform. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, well, um, I was commissioned last year along with composers Barb Johnston and Annika Johnson to uh, engage in the Canadian Music Theatre Project at uh, Sheridan College to create a new musical. And initially the plan was to create a musical that was meant to be staged in a theatre um, about sort of about loneliness, uh, all set during the commercial breaks of a screening party of a reality TV dating show. But as we went into Zoom rehearsals for this process, we started finding really unique and cool opportunities uh, for the story to be told over Zoom. So recently we've pivoted and actually now set the show on a Zoom call. Are you concerned at all that audiences won't follow you from the traditional theater to Zoom? I mean, we hear a lot about people having screen fatigue these days from being in front of their computer all day. The goal is to bring that elusive live element into this experience so that it's not like logging in for a staff meeting. You know, we're we're taking advantage <laughs> of the chat feed. We're playing with the different things that people get so frustrated with, with a Zoom call, like people not unmuting themselves or screens freezing. And so it should be like a really unique, very live experience instead of just feeling like you're watching something that you would rather see in a theater. Uh, Sherry, something you've been exploring lately is intimacy and audience size. You've been working on a project called Red Phone, which I experienced a couple of years ago at the Rudis Festival and enjoyed. And back then, I remember asking myself, is this theater? And after the last six months, I think it is. Can you, uh, can you tell us a bit about how that has worked out? Okay, so Red Phone takes place between two phone booths and is an experience for two audience members at a time. Like you experienced, uh, you read a scripted conversation written by a playwright. So each booth has a red phone and a teleprompter that tells you everything that you are to read your side of the conversation. So during the phone call, you find out who you are, 
who the other person is, what your relationship is, and what the circumstances all through the written dialogue. Uh, so we've had about 27 conversations uh, commissioned now, some translated into French and Spanish. And the phones have been on tour in BC, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec. And I do think that uh, it's not something that's there to be replacing theater. It is in a sense, an essence of what all theater is, the intimacy and the uh, a connection and the in the humanness of all this, but constructed between two phone booths. And Sherry, this is something you've been doing for quite some time, bringing performances to new stages. What have been the biggest lessons for you in this? Uh, that's a good question. I think the biggest lesson is that there isn't any formula or straight ahead way on finding an idea and running with it. So for new work, uh, something that's always anchored me and my approach is to center the audience's experience and bring along excellent artists who have a similar sensibility and vision for what the project is. Uh, Site-specific has played a huge part in like shaking folks out of preconceived notions, uh, like what you experienced, and uh, also kind of falling into a free-form creativity. So it's been... Uh, uh, incredible journey, mostly by the experiences of what what people uh, get from work that's site specific and something that kind of subverts your expectation. Nina, you're also the president of the board of the Professional Association of Canadian Theatres. So you're obviously in touch with companies across the country. You're seeing what's happening, whether it's uh, mm -hmm. theatre in the street, on the radio, or if it's pre-taped. What do you think is working best at this moment? I think everything is. I, I, I am really digging um, our ability to creatively get the stories out there because we know, you know, at the heart of all of this is, is our um, craving to just reach our audiences through great storytelling. So for me, you know, whether what we're doing is a hybrid Zoom theater, theater Zoom, theater phone, like I, I don't want to be bogged down by labels anymore. I think that during at this time where we can play and experiment and risk, let's let's do it. And and let's just connect with our audiences who are so desperately needing um, their souls and their hearts filled with, you know, love and, you know, transformation and illumination. Right. So. I, I'm loving all of it, um, whether it works or not. Let's just keep doing it. It's a nice note to end on. Thank you all so much for joining me. And I'm looking forward to seeing or experiencing all of these projects. Coming up, acclaimed theater director Philip Aiken gives us some important lessons during a moment of civil unrest. I think that if Black artists spent as much time building, supporting, creating, developing Black work as they do trying to change white organizations into being something that they aren't, we would be further ahead. I believe we have to build our own power. We have to make Black art our mainstream thing to do. You can spend your time and your life and your energy trying to fix those organizations, and that's your choice, you know? I say I wish that all that energy was put into help building Black theatre. What does it mean to make something a Black room? It means uh, not code switching. When you could use a phrase that would be immediately understandable to uh, people who grew up in a white culture or people in a black culture. I use the black culture one and everybody got to learn what that is. To create sit uh, situations where black artists could let their shoulders down in the room and just speak. And that has led me to espousing a philosophy that says, every room that I direct in is a black room 
even if I'm the only black person in it. That can be a little mind breaking when you're sitting, you know, in Winnipeg with an all white cast, all white design team, all white building, but it gonna be a black room. That's all there is to do it, right? <laughs> and it has to be that for my own sanity and well being. I have always believed that we put black artists first. Black artists need to get the best top level, platinum level treatment every single time. I mean, I've helped lots of people I don't like, but it's it's not about that. It's about, did they have a decent project? Did they need the help? If I'm going to put black people first, does it, my personal opinion is not the, the guiding light here. It's what's going to help that artist move forward. That would be my hope going forward is that people will be stalwart and unyielding and, and ferocious in the defense of black artists. If you would like to learn more about what's happening with Canadian theater, please visit our website. There we've curated a ton of content from articles on the resurgence of radio plays to interviews with some of the most legendary names in the game. You can find it all at cbc.ca slash arts. It has been an incredible, once-in-a-lifetime ride hosting this show. Thank you for traveling with me from coast to coast to coast to meet some of the most innovative and inspiring creative minds this country has to offer. And I also just want to give a personal thank you to the incredible CBC Arts team who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to find the most brilliant, diverse, and transformative minds, and then write, film, and share their incredible stories. It's been an amazing journey. Until we meet again, peace.